Okay. So we'll record from here on. I may do some editing later if during pieces of our conversation it doesn't really wouldn't help a listener later on to see to, to hear us sort of chat about stuff. But um, in general, this is now being recorded. And if you're just tuning into the recording, hi, sorry, you missed the initial demo. I showed a list of words uh, and uh, I can try to find a way around that when I post the recording. But um, folks are now attempting to recall the words uh, and we will go ahead and move beyond that. And uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about the word list and I just want you to record your answers in, in order as we go through. The first of these is, uh, did you see the word bed? Was the word bed on the list? Yes or no? Just answer for yourself. Next, did you see the word sewing? Was sewing on there anywhere? Next, do you remember the word deer? Was the word deer on the list? And lastly, did you see the word needle? Was needle on the list? So you've got yeses and noes for each of those. Uh, let's uh, go through this. Um, before we do, we'll talk a little bit about those free recall lists. Just pop into the chat the number of words that you came up with. Uh, how many did you remember out of that list? Just out of curiosity, how many are you confident that you definitely have correct? Not pretty good, six and seven, eight, nice. This is a nice quick little demo of um, a phenomenon that psychologists uh, think of as uh, the sort of typical span of this kind of memory, uh, and that is that we, we tend to be able to remember something between five and nine items at a time, uh, unless we engage in some extra uh, kind of technique for memorization. So we're all falling right within that five to nine range. So that's a nice little side demo that we could talk about in a different workshop. But for now, let's uh, reveal the answers here. So um, let's quickly vote uh, um, who said yes, I saw the word bed or or which way say yes or no now in the chat, I guess, for whether you saw bed. Yes, most agree. No, we did not see bed. Uh, so who how about sewing? Yes or no for sewing? Yes, yes, yes is for sewing. Absolutely. How about deer? Easy nose for deer. And how about needle? All right, I've got disagreement on needle uh, and uh, it's actually not on the list. Does anyone's free recall list have needle on it? Just out of curiosity. Throw me a, a needle in the chat if you've got needle on your free recall list. Yeah, very nice. So I'm going to leave you hanging and I promise we will talk about exactly what on earth this was in just a minute. So hang with that cliffhanger for just a little while. So today uh, in the hour we have here, I want to um, give you the definition of memory as uh, I try to understand it, uh, and that is as a network of interactive activation. So we'll try to break down all the jargon in that sentence and, and talk about what it actually means. And then we'll talk about what that gives rise to in terms of an actual experience for people and what the features and, and some of the bugs are of, of that system and how we can use them to uh, aid student learning. And so hopefully this will give you some new ideas because a lot of the folks in here, we have a quite a range um, of folks who are new to the classroom and some who've been in it for a, a good chunk of time. And there is a version of this where we we talk through some of the basics that you could find in books, um, things like, um, you know, students need to get enough sleep. Uh, they should study more than just the bold words in the textbook. Um, they shouldn't play TV and music in the background. Um, uh, get the book, read the book, read the syllabus, come to class, like those simple suggestions. I want to get beyond those uh, and try to give you something that comes from uh, comes from from memory research to, to give you a little bit of extra. Hopefully new knowledge here. So um, memory 
is I think best defined by Atkinson and Schifrin in a um, they're they're both sort of known memory theorists who who gave a definition in 1968. They called it the faculty of the mind by which information is encoded, stored, and retrieved. And so there's two big pieces to this. The fact that memory is, is a faculty of the mind. It's one of the functions of the mind. Uh, and uh, the word mind is important there in that it is different from the word brain. Uh, it's not, we're not talking about the physical aspects of memory here. We're kind of, we're talking about the more um, ethereal kind of approach to figuring out what it is and how what it does and how it works for us in a in a in our daily lives. And then the second piece of this is that for something to be remembered, it should be encoded and then stored and then retrieved. So we have to have all three of those parts of the process. We have to first of all, we have to perceive the thing, we have to experience it, but then we have to send it off and encode it into memory. And then memory has to hang on to it in storage. And then we have to be able to go back and get it. I always think of um, a Seinfeld episode where he's really mad at the rental car center saying, you know how to take the reservations. You just don't know how to hold the reservations. As memory has to do this too. So, um, to, to move us forward, I want to ask, uh, out of the group we have here, uh, I, we've already given some answers, but I want to know, throw in the chat, who feels like they have a, do you feel like you have a good memory? Just give me like a, a, a yes or a no or a shade of gray there. Is your memory good? Are you good at remembering stuff? Not at all, not usually. Most of the time, I can tell you that um, I as I have lists all over the place to try to remember things. Juggling and things get forgotten, absolutely. Life of a university employee uh, on display there. Um, most of the time when I ask people that, that question, they, they typically say no. Um, I'm sure you all have the experience of trying to describe your job to the person next to you on the airplane. And my process there is I tell them what I do and they go, oh, I have a terrible memory. You should study me. And I go, sure. What are you doing later? Um, but then after that, uh, we, we usually end up talking about mnemonics, which are intentional methods for memorization. So when you run into something that you want to try to remember, like say you have a shopping list and you can't take paper with you, uh, or you want to remember uh, a certain uh, the names of the students in your class, or uh, when we were kids, we learned the the states and the capitals and things like that. Even though people aren't very confident in their abilities, those abilities can build over time. Uh, and there's a typo in the second uh, uh, bullet point here because I was just fiddling with these. Um, I want to tell you about memory athletes. So there are people who intentionally learn mnemonic methods so that they can be better, faster memorizers, and they compete against each other. They, they memorize random lists of hundreds of words presented at a one second rate and can recall them in order. But many of these folks, these memory athletes like Nelson Dellis on the top left of the slide here, had more or less average memories when they started training. They just learned about how to use memory. Uh, so having a good memory, being able to remember things is not an inborn talent. It's something that we can practice. Uh, and it's it's not necessarily something that we lose over time. So uh, I'm not going to try to turn us all into memory athletes today, but we, we can improve. We can get a little bit better by grabbing one or two of these methods. Um, just by understanding how memory works and then applying that understanding to uh, to practice. Uh, so we will uh, off give our offerings to the Greek goddess Mnemosyne, uh, the other photo on the slide here. An example of a person with no special skill uh, was a student recruited by a researcher named Anders Ericsson. Uh, the student's name was Steve Falloon, and Steve and Dr. Ericsson met in Ericsson's office every now and then over the course of a few uh, months, I think maybe even a full year of school. And uh, with no particular instruction, Steve learned to memorize quite a long list of numbers all at once just through practice and developing his own personal strategy. Uh, so we have uh, his number of words uh, able to memorize on the 
uh, y axis here in, in one given go, and then the instance of the meaning on the very squished x axis. Uh, so you see that he kind of plateaus a little at first. He has trouble getting beyond 10 or 15, and then eventually starts to figure things out and, and really skyrockets uh, after that. The point being, Steve could do this. We can all do this. Uh, you can do it. Your students can do it. We can utilize these lessons to remember better. So with all that established, let's let's back out and, and talk about memory a little bit more conceptually. So memory is only possible, as I kind of already alluded to, because of perception. Uh, we are only able to remember things because we once perceived them. And our perception, unfortunately for memory, is constructed moment to moment. Uh, it is a process in which we try to gather the information from the world around us as best as we can and fit it neatly into categories of things we've seen before and things that are new to us and in general try to process speedily. Um, you all already know that there are visual illusions out there and that those things get even more complicated when you start combining multiple senses. So it's, it's I think, not too controversial for me to say that perception is imperfect. Uh, we do not perfectly perceive everything around us at all times. And so memory is similarly limited. If perception is constructed moment to moment, memory can thus only be reconstructed after the fact. Uh, so if, if what you perceive is not the true state of the world, then what you remember might not be the true state of the world as it was either. And the reason these processes are constructive is because the background functioning of the mind and the brain and memory and also perception can be thought of as a network and a network of interactive activation. Uh, so the, this image on the slide here is from uh, Hinton in 92, a big Scientific American article where they were proposed starting to talk about neural networks. Um, but the part we're focusing on is actually the middle section, the gray, the gray dots. Yes, there are inputs and outputs, but in between all of that, there is a really wide and really um, uh, heavily interconnected series of nodes that have different strengths of connections between them, that have different complexities of their networks that, res that give rise to what is this constructive and reconstructive process of perception and memory. Metaphorically, it is more accurate to think of your memory uh, like a Wiki Wikipedia page than it is to think of it like most people do, like a video camera. We kind of have this, I think, feeling that as we think back in our minds to uh, an event from when we were younger, we can play it like a video in our heads. And it is true that we have the ability to generate images, mental images, but it gives us this kind of false perception that our memory is a video camera. And it's really a lot more like a Wikipedia page. You, you open up the page and it has links to all the relevant articles, um, it's kind of like how if I asked you to think about the last movie you saw, it might lead you to remember a movie like it or the movie you saw last before that also, or maybe who was in the movie and all those sorts of things like you falling in a Wikipedia hole is not all that dissimilar from trying to remember something. And so the way the network is built has two main features to it. The first of these is that pathways are worn through memory over time through use or practice. So the more often we try to learn something or try to remember something, the more worn the path becomes and the easier it becomes to remember the thing again later on. And the second big feature is that eventually networks of those trails of those paths are created that link to one another so that going down one can lead you directly to one of the others. And so that leads us to uh, a system that looks something like this, where uh, looking at actual neurons here now, um, those networks that we build, those connections are uh, strengthened based on uh, how often and how uh, strongly they tend to work together. We say in, uh, in neuroscience that neurons that fire together wire together. Uh, and so that process is, is how we generally think of this process of uh, uh, building memory over time. And this isn't a new idea. Endel Tolving was talking about this in 1989 uh, when he encouraged people to think of remembering as literally putting pieces of something back together, remembering. Um, 
it is essentially the attempt to enact a prior pattern of mental activity. Um, and, and part of the one of the positive features of all this is that external cues can help us remember things uh, because it naturally reenacts some piece of the prior pattern. You've probably had an experience where uh, a song you heard that r reminds you of a particular time in your life might transport you back to that time. Or maybe you walk past some some place and you smell a perfume of someone you used to date or, or you, you have some other smell that mentally transports you. For me, opening um, tangerines really takes me back to certain times when I was a kid. The reason for this is, again, that when one node of your memory network is activated, all the ones around it become somewhat activated as well. It spreads that activation. It tells the others, hey, something relevant to us is going on, and that starts the process of uh, trying to generate a memory, trying to find something that is familiar based on what's around you. It's why recognizing your friend is easier than trying to describe their face or try to draw them. Uh, it's why telling a story is easier than regurgitating a shopping list. Uh, it's why multiple choice questions are easier to answer than short answer questions. If you have a clue or cue, you are already reenacting some piece of that pattern of mental activity. And so you can uh, have an easier road to finding the rest of that pattern. My favorite example of this was done by Gooden and Baddeley in 1975. They had a group of scuba divers split in half and asked them to study a list of words. Half of those scuba divers studied the list regularly and the other half put on their scuba gear, got underwater and studied the list underwater. After they came out for the test, they split them each group in half yet again so that half of the people who studied on land were tested on land. The other half of them put on their scuba gear and got underwater. And the same was true for the group that studied underwater. And what you can see on the slide here is that the group that studied on land, yes, remembered more words when they also tested on land and remembered fewer when they had to go underwater. But maybe a little counterintuitively, the group that studied underwater also tested better underwater. And the reason for that is that those external cues, those pieces of the uh, pattern of their um, mental activity more closely resembled the original. This is why being in the same room helps us remember things better. While you walk back into the room you were just in, you go, oh yeah, that's what I was doing. There are external cues helping you remember that. It can even be true for mood, state, smells, all that kind of stuff. And this is actually especially important if a test provides really few cues. I worked at a university where uh, all the final exams were done in the gym, in like newly set up desks. And I thought, boy, a multiple choice test in the gym surrounded by all this other like a loud ambient noise and, and a room you've never studied this topic in would be really tough. Uh, we could have made it easier on those students. So these same things that are features of memory uh, can also sort of be seen as bugs potentially. Um, in that as we try to remember uh, particularly something we're remembering from longer ago or a memory that is a little weaker, we start to make inferences without really consciously thinking about it based on our prior experiences and knowledge because, again, the network is becoming activated. So memories quite often include pieces that are implied by the to be remembered information but aren't explicitly part of the memory. So um, if I asked you to remember uh, say a certain time you went out for pizza with a certain group of people um, in the last couple of years, you could probably remember certain aspects of that that might not actually be in your mind, but would be really safe assumptions because of your knowledge about that pizza place and those friends. You could probably guess some of what you talked about. You could probably guess uh, about what time of day it was. All those things uh, fill in our memories a lot of the time. And this is a pragmatic process. It makes good sense. It's based on knowledge we've gained through experience. And so most of the time this leads us to good, accurate memory. But and we don't really notice when that goes on. But sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and those are the moments we notice. Those are the things that lead my plane seat mates to tell me their memories are terrible. A nice example of this was shown by Loftus and Palmer in 1974. So they showed a video of uh, a, a car accident. Uh, and then they asked uh, a question. 
they asked how fast were those cars going when they blanked into each other. And so they had five different groups of participants, each of whom saw a different word in the blank. So some saw smashed, some saw collided, bumped, hit, and contacted. And then they asked all these participants to estimate the speed the cars were going when they ran into each other. And even though they had all seen the same video and not that long ago, their speed estimates can be separated by the verb they saw when, when they answered these follow-up follow questions. Uh, so if they used the word smashed, people estimated about 40 miles an hour. And if they used contacted, people estimated uh, nine full miles an hour slower, 31. And this is hugely important when people are trying to report uh, what happened in an accident to the police right after the fact. Uh, so these, these pragmatic inferences we make from the information we get around us can be uh, pushed in, into mistakes. And uh, in a, a nice follow-up example, they asked everybody a week later, did you see any broken glass, even though there was none in the video? And most people luckily and accurately said no, but in the group that saw smashed, twice as many claimed to have seen broken glass compared to the group who saw the verb hit in that follow-up question. So these tiny, tiny things can have huge, huge influences on our ability to remember. And this falls back into uh, the demo we did at the beginning. So that's called the DRM paradigm, uh, which is an acronym of Deese, uh, who originally came up with this in 1959, and then Rodiger and McDermott, who uh, sort of saw a surge in popularity in it uh, from the 90s to now. In the DRM paradigm, you present a list of semantically or meaning-based uh, words, words that have similar meanings that sort of center around a theme. Uh, I showed you the needle list, which is why I was asking about needle at the very end. And then you show you have a recognition memory test, and that test includes some words that were actually on the list, some words that were unrelated distractors, and then the semantically related distractors. And usually there's one that's sort of everyone has in mind as they make a list. For us, it was needle. For the example on this slide, it's sleep. And what you see is that people report related distractors almost as often as words actually on the list. They're very confident that they were on the list. They even say, I could feel like I could picture that word in front of me. Uh, and it happens even if you know about the effect. And this again is because memory depends on what actually happened, but also our knowledge, experiences, and expectations. Now these aren't flaws. Again, these are costs we pay for the benefits in memory that make it work as well as it does uh, most of the time. And so, um, I, at this point, um, I, I want to pause because I want to get a feel for the room for how everyone, um, how, you, how you think your students study and whether you encourage them to study in a particular way, uh, and then how you test their memory. So I, I think the best way to do this would be to put together breakout rooms of two or three folks to talk your way through the answers to these three questions. Um, I'm not sure if the slides will follow you to a breakout room, so maybe you might want to jot these down really quickly. Um, question one is, how do your students study or how do you think they study? Number two is, how do you tell them to study? Do you give them, when you give them tips, what tips do you give them? And then number three, what's your testing like in your classes? Do you, um, uh, how often do you test? What kind of tests do you put together? Uh, how do you, you know, how do you structure your grades? So I will put you into some groups uh, and then we will uh, come back together in probably like five minutes or so, maybe maybe a little more if, if folks are really chatting um, and uh, see see what our answers are like as a, as a larger group before I go into um, the, the really specific things we can take from this networked structure of memory into classroom based stuff. This requires me to remember how to make breakout rooms, which I literally just looked at and I already can't remember. If you know and you don't mind yelling out to me, I would be 
much obliged. Do I have to stop sharing maybe? I'm not finding a reveal, so uh, it's not revealing itself to me anyway. So why don't we just do this as a big group? Um, so uh, and I'll invite anyone to jump in as, as you please. Uh, how, how do your students study? How do you what's your impression of what they do to study for in, in general or for a test for a specific test? I'll jump in. This is Nicole. Um, we just had an exam today and it was basically like we're going through a diversity of life. So it's a lot of just different family and phyla and I think they just read through the notes. And I would rather them try to find ways to diagram it and kind of organize or put it in some type of graphic like that's how I would do it. Yeah, so um, I, I'll agree with you that that my folks do a lot of reading and rereading also. Some of my students do a combination of things. They might do a lot of rewriting and making note cards and rewriting. Um, they do study groups and they do quizzing of each other. Um, some, awesome. some do, um, what was the, oh, they do, um, create tests. They use like um, Quizlets and they'll create their own tests and do things like that. Your students are pros, Nancy. That's that's all really good stuff. Um, They're nursing students. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really good. Um, getting in groups is something that isn't in my presentation at all, but has been, um, uh, I think, th through a number of different disciplines in teaching and learning research improve student grades. So whenever they get into groups that that helps them no matter what they do. Anyone else? I know um, I used to poll students that got A's on their exams again, nursing students, but what always came up was um, students that uh, looked at their notes multiple times and if they could look at their notes like within 24 hours of, of taking them and then they could like expand on them, that kind of thing or rewrite their notes a lot of times too. Oh, nice. So that that's has three smart things in it that we're all that I'm about to bring up. Um, one is uh, writing the thing yourself is worth doing, especially if you can get away from. The more uh, rote version of that, like Todd mentioned, um, if you can if you can actually get yourself to produce knowledge, that's good. And then another thing you're talking about is asking further questions after something, after you've sort of mastered the content. Uh, the term for that for us is overlearning, and, and that also helps. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the first thing you said was, oh, looking many times over time. And, and uh, I'm sure you, you all are well aware that um, cramming is bad and that spacing out your studying is always better. But that's that's an important feature too. So if a student came in to your office and said, I just all I do, I I read the book, I come to class, I but I still don't do well. How should I study to do better? What would you tell them? I actually this is May. I hear that from students who come in to see me because that's why they come in to see me you know they're like i just need help you know learning how to study maybe they never learned it in high school or they the methods they used to um, use in other classes aren't working for these current classes um and when they say you know like i'm just reading and reading and reading and it's not sticking um mm -hmm. then i try to encourage them to do you know more of that active kind of studying where you are kind of interacting with the material you are making connections to other things you're learning um i tell them you know study in you know short short periods of time with breaks um, so anything that can kind of get them moving, whether it's like physically or just mentally um, and drawing connections um, 
is a really big thing for me when I'm speaking with students and also kind of like teaching the material yourself to other people or to the sure, imaginary yeah. audience. Yeah, yeah, connections are huge. That that might be the, the, the biggest takeaway from this. My presentation is building connections to other things, um, basically widening the network. I'm, I'm about to talk a whole bunch about um, trying to establish multiple routes for retrieval. Um, imagine in the in the path metaphor I was using earlier, you've got a spot on the path or a spot in the park you want to get to. If there are several paths that could lead you there, it's more likely you'll get there than if there is only one. So that's a that's a um, a huge piece. Um, learning to teach or trying to present something is is uh, also a really good indicator of whether you understand the thing, right? Um, anyone who's taught knows this, that as soon, right? Uh, as soon as you walk into a room about to teach something, you uh, it re it's revealed very, very quickly whether you uh, have it down pat yourself or not. I've, I can vouch for being in that situation and getting through an hour and going, hmm, that needed a little more, uh, need a little more out of me, so. Any other? Uh, Thoughts on how you encourage your students to study? I found that students a lot of times, if they have a lot of notes, um, I teach them to like chunk them. So mm. you take like only certain, like the first couple pages, really just focus on that, really learn that. The next day you move to the next couple pages and see what you didn't retain from the first day mm -hmm. um, and just to go through it in that process. I've also had them go back to the objectives of the class for the day and at the end of the class look and say what did can I answer these and what can't I and then go back to their notes to see can they what did they miss. Um, I've also given them like breakout charts for um, like concept titles and then they're supposed to fill in those pieces and that way they could see are they you know what didn't they learn. So those are some of the things I've tried using with students. Very cool. The, um, those all sound great. Um, just encouraging students to break up studying is is something that's really, really hard to actually get them to then go and do. Um, and so what what you're saying, uh, what you're saying at the end there, Nancy, of actually making them do it is is going to be one of my recommendations at the end here too. Absolutely. Um, and there's going through and, and trying to see what you don't remember is a really interesting um, new-ish area of memory and learning research um, where I'm, I'm sure that the findings will eventually be certain that yeah fi finding the edges of your of your understanding is, is a really important piece of continuing to learn mind mapping todd absolutely um, any any way you can get students to visualize concepts takes advantage of the brain's natural proclivity toward imagery uh, so that's always a good thing to do nicole i thought you maybe unmuted yourself to, to join yeah in. i was just going to ask you a question mm -hmm. um i try to encourage students to like physically write their notes um because i've always heard that that helps better with long-term memory and I see a lot of students that still want to either have like a tablet out or they want to have their laptop and just have the PowerPoint like they're they're just scrolling through the PowerPoint as I'm talking um yeah. do you have any thoughts on that or a way to kind of convince them the, there's research literally on this and there's a couple main conclusions from it the first is that when a student's on their computer they're much more likely to get distracted by something else so it's it's it can be worth avoiding for that reason alone and then they distract people around them right who can see their screen um the the thing that seems to drive it is it is generally true that people writing longhand notes re retain information better than people typing notes and the difference there is that people who write longhand uh have to well let me say it the other direction people who type especially young people who type are such good typists that they could type literally everything you say. They could transcribe your lecture into a, a written version of it. And they do not have to very deeply process what you're saying in order to do that. They can just let it sort of flow from their ears into their hands and, and just type it right out. But when students take longhand notes, they can't keep up 
So they're forced to absorb what you're saying, work with it a little bit to write it in a shorter summarized format. So it's definitely, uh, it, it seems to be true in the long run that longhand notes, when done, if, if compared to transcription, uh, are, are an improvement. But if students are writing um, carefully summarized points on their computers, that can be good too. Um, and then of course there's a, um, uh, there's an accessibility thing to consider as well. Maybe a student can't write fast enough or doesn't have the dexterity or, or you know, any other number of issues they might, reasons they might need a computer. Um, and, and then the personal responsibility piece comes in when, when you worry that they're distracting themselves. I mean, that's a, that's a choice for an individual instructor, whether you want to limit that or not. Um, but yeah, that's, does that answer? What you're thinking. Yeah, that, that does help. Yeah, thank you. I used to um, show in Gen Psych, I used to present students with a paper and have them read read a news clipping of, of exactly the, the study I'm thinking of, um, in which they originally compared longhand to, to type notes. And um, I have stopped doing it because uh, my impression is that that finding is more based in transcription versus summarization than literally computer versus writing so but there's one other aspect to that that's interesting and it is um it's called the we call it the production effect which is that if you um if you have to produce any piece of something it makes it a little more memorable as well so um the, the one of the funnier examples of this is that when you bleep swear words out of songs people remember the swear words better because they had to add them back themselves so the act of producing the word made it a little more memorable. So that that has something to do with with note taking in general and with, you know, some something to do with repeating your notes. But again, if you're literally just retranscribing yourself as a student, it's not all that helpful. Can be, but it could be better. There, there are more effective things to do. Let's talk just a little bit about testing then. Um, what kinds of what kinds of questions are, are is everyone asking uh, on their on their exams? Are we seeing are, is there a lot of multiple choice, a lot of short answer mixed between the two writing assignments instead of tests? What, what do we have going on in the room? For a lot of my sorry, this is Caitlin. Um, for a lot of my classes, I that have tests, they are a combination of short answer um, and multiple choice types of questions and, and matching, um, especially if it's really, but I try to make the matching questions rather than just definition, like a, a situation, I guess, and they have to match it to what that would be representing. Um, but I do like to mix it up because it's hard to grade, <laughs> grade a lot of fill in the blanks, <laughs> or I mean, sorry, short answers. It is. Um, uh... I, I continually think back to um, some something I read where somebody was um, celebrating how excited they were to assign a bunch of really complicated and, and writing based assignments and then uh, just crying their eyes out as soon as they had to go and grade them all. Uh, so there's there's that to be considered as well. Multiple choice, uh, Audra says true, false, matching, short answer. Yeah, so all the all the things. Um, Great. All right. Well, I um, I will go ahead and push us forward. I think I'll bring my slides back on. All right. Thanks for bearing with me through there. I thought that I knew how to do <laughs> breakouts, but I apparently didn't. I uh, um, when I was teaching online last year, I was on Zoom, not Teams, so I never really got to know Teams that well this way. So let's move forward. Uh, I, I will in my last section here is, is where I've got um, what I hope are the, the concrete suggestions for for ways to uh, encourage students to study. Uh, and as time probably I don't know if we'll be we'll have much time at the end, but the, the thing I want you to be thinking about, I guess, is um, to uh, to get into the uh, into Nancy's model of, of this, which is to force students to do these things. So how can you generate assignments? that will uh, get them to start doing these things themselves. 
uh, and 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 then you know the next thought beyond that is can you offer some points for it and the thought beyond that is um do you have time to grade it and then the final one is maybe you can remove something else in favor of grading something uh something like these so here we go Number one, testing, uh, as as folks have already mentioned, is a really powerful way to learn. Uh, the, the primary maker of this research is uh, Roddy Rodiger, who we already mentioned. He of the, the he's the R in the DRM uh, paradigm. So he's done a lot of work on testing as a learning tool and very consistently over time. If you have one group of students go through three study sessions and then a final test, they are beat in the final test by a group that studies and then takes two pretests and then a final test. And, and basically that effect expands as long as you allow it to. You could study six times and take a test and somebody who studies five times and takes two tests will outperform you, but somebody who studies twice and takes four tests will outperform them. Testing is very powerful as a learning tool. This is also related to the production effect. If you're doing a test, you are doing some production. If you're if you're testing yourself, you're getting yourself to come up with answers. But more than that, what you're doing is you're engaging in actual practice. Uh, so if you, for example, uh, went to study uh, by um, reading and rereading the textbook, you, if a student went to <laughs> uh, study by reading and rereading their textbook, and then they came to your uh, test and it was uh, multiple choice questions or short answer questions, they would have done something not unlike learning to skate really fast uh, and then uh, turning over in that and uh, trying to use those skills to go and play hockey. They will be better at the test after having read and reread and reread than they would have if they hadn't, just as you'd be a better hockey player if you're a faster skater but you won't be as good as somebody who's played hockey for as long as you've been skating. So if you've tested yourself, you've done the thing uh, and you, you your your mind will already be able to reactivate that same pattern of activity. You things will be much more familiar in the test format. If you're trying to sw swap formats on yourself at the last second of the test is what leads to struggle. One of the big things that we've already been talking about is working your region of proximal learning. This is something that Janet Metcalf has worked on for a number of years. Um, basically, this is the importance of context. It's, it's impossible to learn something, not impossible, but very difficult to learn something new if you don't know what it connects to that you already know or what it might connect to that you're going to learn in the future. You can't work within the network if you don't know where you are in it, just like you couldn't navigate a map if you didn't know where you were on it. Um, Dr. Stephen Chu has a, a, a nice phrase he uses sometimes when he says that students think that knowledge is individual pieces rather than one long connected thread. Uh, and we need to encourage them and show them that that's not the case. So showing them how things connect is one way to do this. Um, but encouraging them to find ways that things connect to one another is, is, is maybe the, the most important thing we can do for them because what this allows within the um, within this networked metaphor I'm drawing is that uh, you have then more avenues for retrieval if you know of more connections. Again, if you're trying to get to one spot in the park, if you have many paths there, it's much easier than if there's only one. Working the region of proximal learning also takes advantage of the mind's proclivity for storytelling like we already discussed and uh, the, the easiness with which we generate mental images. And something I'm thinking about working on soon with students is, is trying to show them how how useful it can be to think of yourself as a generalist. Uh, in other words, somebody who is a sort of expert in many things, uh, the kind of person who finds connections between topics that might seem very different at first glance. Uh, this is this comes from uh, some sort of sports psych theory and, and the way that uh, uh, the Williams sisters in particular played every sport growing up and uh, they, they and their father believe this is what made them such incredible tennis players. Uh, a finding from uh, Bob Bjork uh, and, and many colleagues over years is that uh, desirable difficulties promote recall. Uh, the, the basis here is that if the process of studying feels easy, it's probably too easy. Uh, there's there's like a Goldilocks area. There's a, you don't want to be super frustrated when studying or when learning, but the, the the jargony way to say this is on the slide that um, 
your performance during acquisition can be an unreliable index of whether you're actually learning anything. The, the bane of my existence is when students make flashcards uh, because you look at the thing and then you flip it over and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I knew that. And it's a, it's a very, it feels so easy. It feels like you knew it because you flip it over and you see it, but all you're doing is recognizing, you're not recalling. And so when you get to the test, you're not gonna be able to flip the test over and see the answer. So um, this, uh, this, this feeling of ease is, is a, something we need to encourage them to pull themselves out of. It, it should feel a little challenging when you're studying, especially if you're studying something new. Part of this is because if you're, if it feels easy to study, you might not be adding any information. You, are, you maybe aren't forging a new path for yourself in your memory. You also might just not be paying enough attention, which is a whole other issue. This is also not a new idea. Um, William James wrote about this all the way back in 1914. Uh, he said that the art of remembering is the art of thinking. And by adding that when we wish to fix a new thing in our mind or a pupil's, our conscious effort should be not so much to impress or retain it in them as it is to connect it with something else that's already there. So this is a, something we can take away as teachers is try to connect what you're showing your students to something you know they already know. This can be through drawing of interesting examples, student relevant examples, or connecting it to the thing you just taught them because that's probably what it links the most to. Or something you know they know from another class, from another course, from another department. All that stuff will will aid recall over time. Another thing we really confidently know uh, is that spacing study episodes uh, slows forgetting over time. This is a finding from the 1880s, actually. Uh, Herman Ebbinghaus is on the slide here. Basically, through testing himself in many, many situations, uh, he found that uh, if you distribute your practice so you don't cram, uh, not only do you recall more information when the test does come, but the reason for that is because your forgetting curve, the rate at which we lose whatever we just learned, is uh, made less steep. It is uh, it's shallowed a little bit. Uh, it enables you to uh, remember some of, let some of your study sessions remind you of others. It again gives you more avenues for recall. Uh, and he, this is also the way he learned about uh, overlearning, which we, we talked about back at the beginning. So there he there he is added to our crew here. Uh, and our last addition is uh, Fergus Crake, uh, who found, uh, um, along with many other folks, that deeper processing can lead to better retention. So this is related to all those same things. Um, but Crake's findings were uh, called levels. He called them levels of processing. Basically, the um, more interactive a subject gets with the thing they're trying to remember, uh, the more likely they will be to remember it. So this was showing undergrads word lists and asking them to, sh to process the words in the list in a shallow medium or deep way. Um, so shallow would be like, uh, remember how many U's you see in the, in the words in the list you're about to uh, flip through. And then medium might be consider whether each of these items is larger or smaller than a grapefruit. Uh, and then an example of deep processing would be Think about whether you like or hate the all the items we're going to see in the list here. And getting that personal relationship uh, and personal level of example leads to deeper processing because it creates more connections with other can, other material in memory that has more connections itself and so leads to uh, longer and better and clearer retention. Um, there's another fun little finding in this area by Jim Nairn uh, from Purdue he called survival processing, which is that if you show a list of words and ask students to think about how they'd use each of those things on a deserted island, they're going to remember that list of words particularly well. So uh, there's a lot of uh, personal relation in that. So here we go. This is the bullet pointed list of all the things. Uh, if uh, if you have one slide you take home, uh, this this could probably be the one. The first, of course, practice to encourage students to practice how they'll be tested encourage them and you know what by the way um, in addition to this uh, consider testing them how you know they practiced um, th think about how you might be able to alter your testing methods so that um, so that students can show you what they actually know uh, rather than uh, flipping the script and, and, and trying to get them to to draw conclusions or, or generate information in a way different than they ever have Students should seek difficulty in their studying. They should find desirable difficulty, so they should try to produce knowledge themselves uh, in a in a meaningful 
engaged way, uh, generate their own examples. It can be nice to pause in class and ask students to generate their own examples because two things happen there. You see whether they're following you and they understand uh, or and you also see uh, you get some examples that you could use in the future. Difficulty creates multiple avenues for retrieval uh, and, and a nice way to get at this too could be to study in different ways and places. Uh, if you study underwater and you know the test is on land, you might want to study on land as well. Work that region of proximal learning, seek relational processing, seek deep processing, um, in, investigate the idea of whether you can overlearn. Can you ask yourself additional questions about the thing you were studying or can you apply it to your own life? Use imagery, use story, uh, encourage students to link what they're learning to things they know well, and of course, encourage them to space out their study episodes. So we are out of time. Uh, which is no problem. So I'll kind of leave you with these ideas to, to take away, and I'm sorry we can't work on these together. If you want to follow up, I'm happy to chat with any anyone uh, uh, via email or, or in a meeting after this. Um, I, I'd say we should brainstorm ways we can foster these behaviors in students other than just telling them, other than giving them the advice. Uh, and in the classroom, that's that's doable. When, when you're in a role in, in assisting students study habits, that's a, a slightly different challenge. Um, but trying to come up with assignments that force this kind of effective studying or um, or maybe thinking about changing up testing occasionally to uh, uh, one, one thing that really works, by the way, would just be to test students all the time uh, rather than asking them to study, 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 study and then have a test at the end. Why don't you give them five quizzes along the way or 10 quizzes? I did. I think I did 10 quizzes one year in gen psych. And, um, they uh, they hated the sound of it at the beginning, but they got very used to it and it, and it went pretty well. And the last point I think about sometimes is trying to imagine how they'll use this information out in the world uh, after college and because uh, college is the world, but after after college and, and testing the way that that they'll be tested, then making sure that they can use the information in the way they'll need to use it because they're not going to go out into the world in most places and be given multiple choice tests. So if we can try to find creative ways to test them the way that they'll actually need the information. Uh, I think that can that can do them well. Um, I've tweeted a thread of some of these ideas. If you uh, if you're on Twitter, um, Nelson Dellis has a really cool website with techniques for for these kinds of thoughts. Um, memory athletes use things like personal relevance and imagery and story mostly. Um, and uh, yeah, that's I, I'll sort of finish there. I, I have one last little point on here that. Um, Working memory load is a totally different but related topic to all this, so I'll just I'll not bother saying that. Um, and uh, if I, I hate to keep people after, I, I, I know that many of you probably have places you already need to be, so if you've got to go, thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, again, if you want to follow up with me at any time, I'm around. Uh, but if you want to stick around and chat at all anymore, I'm I will I will stick for a little while. But thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for participating.